fine line. Now, the strings in here, uh, they are, everything is nylon, I believe, and the strings each are rated at 35 pound te test. Well, it appears this parachute shroud line has only got four lines in it. So I would have to call it dash four. Well, when you want to separate the two, there's a way of, of pulling out the, the threads, and you're left with a hollow tube. This is usually, I think, called the mantle, and this is called the kern. So in, in the parlance of uh, um, mountaineers, this would be called kern mantle rope as opposed to regular twisted rope and other, other things. Uh, this having been in service a great deal, it's a little, uh, a little more challenging to separate, but you can withdraw. So you find that each string is rated at 35 pounds, and each string can be unraveled into three, which is rated at dental floss. It's a common thing to get a seat stuck between your teeth in the middle of nowhere in the bush, driving you crazy, and you didn't bring any dental floss. Well, if you got paracord, that's the beginning of the 50 things that you can do with paracord. <laughs> now, this is now more elastic. You've reduced its strength considerably, and uh, well, you might find that it works better in certain applications. And I'll demonstrate. Now, the jam knot is actually not too complicated. I'll demonstrate it with a big rope, here, which I coil up in the proper fashion. This is a wrap attack rope from the firefighters, and when the rope reaches a certain amount of usage, it's taken out of service, and then we can work with it a great deal. If I want to tie this around my waist, it's simply go around. And nylon being what it is, the end you're working with has to have a knot in it or it'll, uh, the knot will run off the end. So you've got to put a knot there. Using this end, and you tie another knot exactly behind the first one with this knot pointing up the long end of the string. That's, that's essentially probably about 90% of the jam knot. Now to come to tighten it, you go like this and the two knots will run against each other. So if you tie these things too wide apart, you always have to take that extra few seconds to make the knots come together. The thing is here that the paracord has the facility of sort of partially melting as you really grind it against one surface against the other, but it will loosen, but it will momentarily tighten to give you time to lock it. And before you get too tight, you turn and capture this little loop and now you pull with all your might until it's as tight as you actually want it. You might use your feet and pull back, as I will demonstrate, and it'll hold momentarily until you, well, there's lots of rope here, and this is the end of my career. So I'll just cut it off for simplicity's sake. And maybe we'll teach people how to whip these ends later. But the uh, situation is, that when you take this and put it in that loop and gently make the loop disappear, that's the complete knot. Now once you learn to apply this knot in a crushing force, you'll discover that there is more uses for this knot than almost any other knot that I know. You don't have to believe me, but I don't give a poop what you believe. <laughs> Whether you believe me or not, I'm not going to be the one that suffers. You can live by your own sort of thing. So there we're going to put you through the steps. My feeling is, that to teach you something as thoroughly as it should be taught is better than to show you a, a gazillion other things. Well, I plan to cover the tin whistle and a few other things, but once you have mastered the, the jam knot. Now, we have little booklets. There's one that's called the seven most important bush knots. Actually, you could say the seven most important knots for any educated person in Canada to know. It's not just survival, but it happens those knots. Everything in the outdoors is uh, more than likely tied together rather than nailed or screwed or glued or whatever. So you've got to build a pack frame, a puck saw, a ski shoe, almost anything. Um, you might use this to replace a hose clamp or maybe you have a, a problem with a hose that's misbehaving and you need a clamp. Uh, you can 
plant things perfectly. Here we have a circumstance that we take a long board and a short board, and if it's Sunday, you lash them like that. So those three ends are the same length. One time I had an exercise uh, on one course, and the following course there was a priest that showed up in that course, and he was wondering what the significance was of all these crucifixes. <laughs> <laughs> now when you go to lash anything together, there is a phenomenon that occurs that if you want it to be like this, and you hold it and try to tie it, you let go of it and it goes loose. So you put it at this, what I call the magic cross, which is a neutral cross. This is not so good, and this is not so good. But this is right there. So when you tie it, it stays there, because that's the way things are in life. And then when you go to the other diagonal, as you tie it tightly, it assumes this position. And you will see, as we pass this around, that this will be hard as a rock. And that uh, when you make a lash this way, it's a lash. It isn't sort of. Now in the old days, when you didn't have paracord, which has a 15% a elasticity, that means if I took 100 meters of paracord and pulled on it hard enough, it would stretch to 115 meters. And that acts like an elastic. That can knock your eye out. That can. <laughs> That elasticity in a bigger rope can break ribs, can, can uh, knock an eyeball out of its socket, and so on. So you've got to understand some of these things. Now anyway, where is that rope? Now it's up to you. You can practice without pulling out the string. But here I tie a knot in the end. And then I go around. Now, another way to remember the knot is to tie a slip knot that looks like this so that the two knots are on the same end, not on opposite sides. That's called a strangle, strangle noose. That means that when I put this around something and I pull on it, it'll likely tighten. And if it tightens enough, it won't back off because there'll be this little bit of a nip that occurs. So you've got the two ways of doing this. If there are 10 different ways to tie a knot, you must master all 10. And students don't like that. They only say, well, why, I, why do I need more than one way of tying a knot? Well, you'll find out later at night that there's many different ways to skin the cat. Now, since I've tied the loop, I'll just slip it over. And here I have the circumstance that I got that and I'm ready to tie. Now, when the string runs through the knot and then beside itself, that's where you can draw this knot up in a tremendous crushing force. So I should separately demonstrate what we're talking about. Let's break this chair. <laughs> so here is this. Let's start over again here. There, I made that first knot disappear. I go around and I tie, and I'll guide you through this. And there I've tied that. It's the very same knot. Now here, when I want this to tighten, if I pull this way, it doesn't work. If I pull this way, it takes up the slack. And here's where you're drawing with a great crushing powerful force. Right there. Until when you pluck it, you get the note of G or whatever. Or even F, it doesn't matter, but you'll get a note at any rate. So you can draw this up to an extremely tight. And when you draw up any rope or work with anything, do not line yourself up. Don't like hold it like this and then pull like this. So if something snaps, it's uh, not a nice feeling to get whapped in the eye and then wonder whether you have an eye or not. And you're that few moments that you're saying to yourself, do I still have an eye? Because it sure feels like I don't. Don't line yourself up with anything. Uh, there's enough hazards in life about that. But anyway, and if I was asking you, there, I don't know, what note is that? Who's the musician here? That, that you get, uh, ten you can get an unbelievable tension by using your back and your legs, which, uh, in some cases will save your life, in other cases, well, it just, but, now I haven't locked it, so I can loosen it, <laughs> but this old stuff here doesn't want to back off because it's kind of like old and, and skanky. Anyway. Now if I want to untie this knot, because I have sort of made some kind of, an, I, I don't want to waste stuff that, that's uh, maybe precious and 
That very first knot you tied, if you cut it off, you've only wasted a centimeter there. Now the knot comes off and more or less comes undone by uh, there. And that's all you wasted was this amount because you cut off that first knot. If you don't tie that first knot, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Yeah, because I couldn't remember the jam knot and I couldn't feel why it wouldn't work. And suddenly, an hour later, it's, oh yeah, there's supposed to be a knot in the end. <laughs> now here we have a magic cross. If I was tying a tripod together, tripod, there would be one stick and two sticks parallel, but still at the magic cross. So here you tie it. Now that's the neutral, that the, the magic cross. <laughs> It's the neutral, uh, uh, that as tight as you tight it, that's the natural position that the two sticks will take. Now before I tighten that, I've got to set up this loop to lock the knot after I've drawn it up. And that's what I've done there. And now I'm looking at which way the knot, I have to parallel the string beside itself. I hope I make this confusing enough that you'll, you'll sort of say, I'm never ever going to be able to learn this knot. There, I'm, I've drawn it up, it's already snug, but I might stand on this and I might pull, and of course when you pull something really, really hard, you can pull it even harder if you go like that. That's about <laughs> twice as tight as it would have if I didn't make that sound. <laughs> anyway, so now I watch everything, I don't want to snarl things up, and I take this end and I draw that loop till it disappears and now the knot can't loosen. I've locked it. It's called a half hitch. So that's the complete knot. Now to do the other diagonal, you'll find that when I draw these boards around like this, it even tightens the knot even more. So as I do this like that and then tie it, lash it so that it's at 90 degrees, you'll find I've created a rock hard lash. Tie a knot ten times better than it should be, and it'll just be just right. So now, do the same thing for the other diagonal. But now we're going to eliminate the magic cross. Now, there is a problem in that you might have to tie this knot in darkness. Therefore, you have to master this knot with your eyes shut, and perhaps in this much water. <laughs> <laughs> behind your back, <laughs> and then that way you'll forever remember it. Now, the Junior Forest Board movement, I've been around for many, many years, particularly the Calgary clubs. And uh, we would have this sort of general standard weekend where you learn a lot of, a lot of little things, basically everything focused on, you know, survival, how to light a fire, how to build a bed, how to build a shelter and everything. After a while, people would say, you know, we've had this so often, is there something else we could do? And I'll say, how about knots? Knots? Won't you cover all your knots in the first hour or so? I said, no, just, just let's just, you know, take it on faith. Let's have a knot tying weekend. There are the seven, that little booklet there has got seven knots. Well, when I talked them into it, and we'd start and have, you know, a little bit of tying and Friday night and then Saturday night to nine and Sunday nine till four. We are not four. <laughs> <laughs> we still had three more knots. And people in general somehow think knots are just knots. No, they could be tied the way they should be. The way a sailor would tie a knot on board a ship and the way all these other things. Uh, it takes time for you to learn to tie the knot almost instinctively or without your eyes, or behind your back. And knots are kind of interesting in that it involves behind, around, over, under, and everything. A lot of people have a problem with that. They need to spend a, a, an hour or two getting used to that notion of the knots going in and out and doing all kinds of things. And then all of a sudden they have this aha moment and from then on that isn't a problem. But you have to work at it for a while to eliminate the problem. And if you don't work at it to eliminate the problem, it'll take you for the rest of your life. Here now I start to draw up the knot, again, pulling in the direction that the two strings <coughs> parallel each other. And it's starting to take up 
but before it gets too tight, you've got to produce that, you have to think one step ahead and produce that loop that you're going to lock the knot with. There. Now I start to draw on that, and as I draw, I get that, I keep bringing it over to where I want the cross, you know, you, you don't get full marks if your cross isn't perfectly 90 degrees. <laughs> and I, the reason I, <clears throat> They talked me into coming to these things. I'm 76 years old. <laughs> I, uh, I look forward my whole life to get away from all this, but they still keep talking, and I, you know, it's too soft, and I agree, and I come. <laughs> I'm totally out of practice. Probably the last time I tied this knot this way might have been five years ago. Oh, I know. And now I'm confronted with the problem of putting on a good showing, and I'm rusty and old and half blind, and I stink. <laughs> and things like that. And uh, the, uh, you know, that's why. One of these days when I say no, it's going to be no. <laughs> so here we struggle with this ah, and keep moving it to where it belongs and keep drawing it up. Maybe you stand on this. Stand on it a little bit. Use all your might. Learn how to tie this. That's probably close enough. And again, there is the loop. And then I take the other end and gently watch what I'm doing as I draw up that half hitch because you can really pile up and snarl and make things messy if you don't. Uh, and so I'm watching carefully and you hear things clicking all over the place there. And uh, I would be docked for that. It's not exactly. But as you pass it around, you, you tell me how can you lash anything together using about this much strength with this hardness, You're, <laughs> this is lashed. It's not just tied together. So that's the whole issue of, uh, of the, uh, the jam. And the break. Now I'll give everybody. You can thread it, but that's tedious. Usually you just grab the knot and turn it. When you turn it, then this is on this side there. You got it? I think so. Okay. And then this one comes to here. You've got two distinct groups, horsey people and mountain people. they got to have some kind of things to talk about. Well, the horse people said, what is the safest loop to put around a horse's neck? And the mountaineers, well, surely it must be a bow line. A bow line, bow line on a ship is the line from the bow that you throw. <laughs> There's a loop on the end. So you, the loop is called uh, a power line. Well, when you put a loop around a horse's neck, and it's a bow line, and the horse jerks it fiercely, it turns over and becomes a strangle knot. That means here it's normally considered to be a, a fairly secure and useful knot, but a very powerful pull will cause the knot to flip over and when it flips over, now it's a knot that the tighter it's tied, the tighter it holds. So the horse flips the knot and starts to strangle itself. And just imagine a horse that's choking itself to death by the fact that it's pulling so hard and jerking on the rope. How are you going to approach that horse and cut the rope? Or how are you going to release it? It's not a good thing to allow a strangle noose to form on your favorite horse's neck. And so the, the horse people said, no, Bolin kills horses. Mountaineers said, well, then I guess we, have, we don't know what loop to use. Well, I carried on. Every time I had the opportunity, if I met a cowboy or somebody, I'd say, hey, what is the loop? And one day, it was Mr. Bradshaw. He had these bowed legs, and when he put his heels together, a pig could run between his knees without touching him. He was so bowed. And I said, what kind of a loop do you use around a horse's neck? And he showed me. A knot that I had not, when I'm sort of a not crazy person, I had never seen that knot described in any of the knot books. It was way that he was brought up in southern Alberta, and uh, the cowboys there knew a form of bowling that never turns over. It, so, because I'd never seen it anywhere else, and he showed it to me, I called it the Bradshaw bowling. So, when you go to tie a bowling, the rabbit comes out of the hole, goes around the tree twice completely, 
and then usually you should set it up so that you can then tie the rope by jerking on it. It's called a, the, uh, that's the Bradshaw bowling. It goes around, twice around, and then the slip so you can undo it, and then the horse can free itself by whatever. So I'll just show you, that's in here. <laughs> so if you want to know a bit of junior, junior forest word in history, if you ever run across the term the Bradshaw cowboy bowling, that's where it comes from. All right, so here we've got two pieces. One twice as long as the other. Take the short piece, and if you say arc, some student is going to say, what's Noah got to do with this whistle? They don't understand the word arc. If you say rainbow, they understand. If you say hill, they understand. Hill might be better, because if you can't walk up that hill, it's too steep, it won't work. And then you take this bent part without compromising the space that's going to be between and you make a small little cross, a Celtic cross at a Celtic mouse's grave, with the three ends here being equal length and whatever is left over. And without squashing the hill, you make the two side folds and the third fold, and now that piece is locked on there for a channel to blow. Then you draw that back so there's no jiggle, and you make a sharp seven. Then you take the seven and change it into a question mark without the dot. <laughs> Like so. That's how they used to sell whistles. Then somebody welded sides on about 100 years, no, 127 years ago, because I learned that 27 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so 127 years ago, they would make whistles like that. So now your fingers complete the whistle. And it, I'm a whistle doctor, so I know what it takes to be able to adjust it. If I flutter my tongue, now when I tell grade six students, I say, I'll teach you the Morse code, and then you can talk dirty in the schoolyard, and the teachers won't know what you're saying. In the next half hour, they're well on their way to master the Morse code. <laughs> now the Morse code goes like this. A is dot, dash. This here, you feel it. B is dash, dot, dot, dot. Do you see it? D is dash dot dot, H is dot 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 dot, I is dot dot, S is dot dot dot. Yeah. If you look at it that way, Morse must have looked at it that way. So if you take the capital letters, you can form for about three quarters of the, of the, uh, 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 the uh, so you very rapidly learn the, the, to, to use dots and dashes. A dot is like this, I'm using my tongue. A dash is three times. So my name is M-O-R-S. This is what it sounds like in Morse code. How do you say ship? S dot dot dot. H dot 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 dot. I dot dot. P you gotta memorize is dot dash dash dot. And R is so similar like P, except R's got says dot dash dot. So now the is dash, dot, 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 and E is the dot because you use it so much. So now you can talk dirty <laughs> because you know how to spell ship and the, and you can find the words in the two to come up with <laughs> the ship. <laughs> the ship. Anyway, that's what the, well, let's see, this is an average whistle. And you can tweak it and everything. The entrance here, it can be quite large, but you flatten the other end, and the gap is like imagining a phys ed whistle. I had one around my neck for a while ago. It's still there. there. It's still there. Look at this. That gap. Look at that gap there. <laughs> That's a cost the dollar thirty-nine. But anyway, uh, you you work at it. If your whistle isn't working, when you're working with people, they make the whistle, and rather than you putting your filthy lips on it, you you uh, hold it for them the right way and they blow to verify that it's been folded properly. And now what happens if I use a big thick one here? At the one third point, I fold it, or thereabouts, straight and bend, straight and bend. Uh, a lot of, you know, in, in, a, in everyday life, kids don't know that you can take a piece of wire and flex it and break it, it'll break eventually. So when you don't have a cutting tool, you gotta know how to break certain things and so on. You take the short piece and make it into a hill. If you can't walk up the hill, 
if it's a U, it doesn't work. If it's too flat, it doesn't work. So you just write if it's a nice hill or a rainbow. Now you'll also find that by bending, there'll be a scratchy. Uh, when I broke that, and I run my finger like that, and if I uh, am not folded right, that sharp could cut my mouth. Now in the junior forest wardens, twice, kids have swallowed these whistles. So you should not make them out of anything but aluminum. Parents get extremely excited about the fact they swallowed a whistle. I don't know why. <laughs> I w you would think that if it's aluminum, by the time it gets to the bottom of the stomach, it's dissolved. If it's, if it's tin, you're probably going to end up whistling, but not the, the, the other end. <laughs> it's have to be kind of sharp. So you'll say, ouch, when, when you hear the whistle. Anyway, you put it on. Now look at how short that's turned out. But I, they call me Morris plier finger because I can still bend it. And uh, I got the three bends, got everything. Now it's very important that there's no jiggle. Any jiggle, will, the whistle won't work. You gotta pull it back and then a sharp seven, not a round seven, very sharp seven. And then curl it around. It does not have to be perfect. It just has to be a chamber. It could be pretty irregular. But you, you know, if you're going to do it, I mean, there's probably some merit to learn. Now, this has got a different configuration than the first one. And I leave it big here, and I bite it there, or flatten it, line it up. It's got to line up so the jet of air that goes there has to hit that cutting edge. Now, it's, it's uh, because my chamber is so much smaller, these two whistles actually sound alike. But normally, you should have had a... Uh, yeah. If you've got two whistles and you blow at the same time, uh, science comes into play. Science rear, rears its ugly head and you hear a beat. Two different notes. But those are so close you can't hear the beat. 